Now, if you take our delta equal to epsilon over 5, we can see that we have proved that our function is continuous and the proof is done. So you're telling me that you just proved that fx equal to x squared is continuous at point x equal to 2 by this much of writing? Yes. Can't you just see the graph of the function? This is clearly continuous. Well, to answer to your objection, we need to go back to 200 BC. Before that, I want you to subscribe to my channel and also see my gravitation series. I'm trying to understand the mathematics of gravity. So let's travel back in time. Back in time where there was no epsilon and delta on the blackboards, back in Greece there was a man named Archimedes. Archimedes was trying to find the volume and area of different shapes. To do that, he thought that he could approximate the volumes with the method of exhaustion. Let me explain what Archimedes did with an example. Consider a circle. Archimedes was interested to find the area of this circle. He thought that hexagon is a good approximation of a circle. As you can see, the gap between the hexagon and a circle is not much. So he thought, let's increase the number of sides to get a better approximation. And by continuing this method, he could calculate the area of a circle and he could even approximate pi. It was visual, geometric and deeply intuitive. But there was something that ancient Greeks were afraid of, and that was infinity. They could not understand the concept, so they put infinity aside. Then there came Renaissance. In the Renaissance, two famous mathematicians rose above, Sir Isaac Newton and Leibniz. And they both claimed that they have invented calculus. It brought a revolution, finally. A systematic way to deal with change, motion, and infinitesimals. But their methods were not rigorous. They spoke of quantities that were infinitely small, smaller than any real number, yet somehow not zero. It worked in practice, but it wasn't clear why it worked. One of the most brilliant and yet most dangerous minds of that era was Leonard Euler. He was a powerhouse of intuition. He worked with infinite series like they were just long sums of numbers. But the results weren't always reliable. For example, he boldly claimed the sum of all natural numbers is equal to negative 1 over 12. Well, here's a demonstration of how he did it. Here is what Euler did. First, he named D series the grand D series. Then, he assigned the value half because he thought that the sum of these series at each step is shifting between 0 and 1. So he thought that it would be reasonable to assign this series the half value. Then he took this alternating series and he summed it like this. Saw that the sum of two alternating series become just 1 grandy series and the grandy series had the half value so he thought that this would have the value a quarter then in the final step he just took the original series and subtracted the alternating series and summed it like this he got s minus quarter equals to 4s and that's how he got the value negative 1 over 12. This is not a sum in the usual sense, it doesn't converge normally, but in modern view, using zeta function regularization, this value does appear in quantum physics and string theory. Euler didn't have this tool, he was navigating the unknown, using intuition over rigor. His result is a perfect example of why analysis had to be rebuilt with precise definitions. At the time, people believed that if a function was continuous, then it must be differentiable at almost every point. After all, smoothness and continuity seem to go hand in hand. Then came a shock. 
1872, Carl Weierstrass constructed a function that was continuous everywhere but differentiable nowhere. It looked smooth, but under the microscope it was jagged and wild, like a mathematical coastline. No matter how far you zoomed in, the irregularity never stopped. This shattered the old belief that continuity implied smoothness. It became clear that intuition had reached its limits. Meanwhile, Agustin Luis Cauchy, decades earlier, had already seen the cracks. He began rebuilding calculus from the ground up, introducing precise definition of limits, convergence, continuity and more. Then Weierstrass took it even further. He formalized the now famous epsilon delta definition of limits, finally giving a solid footing to ideas that had floated in vague terms for centuries. But the work of Kashi and Weishras was only the beginning. Once the cracks in intuition had been exposed, a new generation of mathematicians stepped in to rebuild the foundation and expand the universe of mathematical analysis. In the late 1800s, a foundational shift was already taking place. The birth of modern logic and set theory. Mathematicians like George Cantor, Richard Detkin, and Gottlob Frege were redefining how we understand numbers, sets, and infinity itself. Cantor in particular introduced the radical ideas that there are different sides of infinity, and developed set theory to explain them, a move that was controversial at the time, but ultimately essential to rigorous mathematics. Set theory provided the scaffolding that rigorous analysis needed. Without a clear understanding of what a real number even is, concepts like continuity and limits would float in abstraction, and logic gave mathematicians the tool to structure proofs and build mathematics from its principle a vision that David Hilbert would later try to formalize completely. At the turn of the 20th century, Hilbert wasn't just solving problem, he was laying out an ambitious program to maximize all of mathematics. He helped pioneer a functional analysis, which treats functions like points in abstract space. Functional analysis deals with infinite dimensional spaces, where intuition has no meaning at all. So no, mathematical analysis isn't just some elite academic game. It's a universal language, a framework that tells us when our ideas are solid and when they're not. 